you, Ryan. Take your Bible to Romans, 8th chapter, 29th verse. Romans, the 8th chapter. Today we will read verse 29 and verse 30. You get there, stand with us, please. We'll go ahead and read this, read this couple of verses of Scripture for our text, and we will commence the message. Just to put this back into context, and we talked about context last, I believe it was last Sunday morning, and, uh, and, and that is that we find out what's happening before, and we find out what's happening after, and we make certain the passage that we're talking about is in line with, with, with those two things. What that does is that prevents us from jerking one verse of Scripture and making it say whatever we want it to say, because there are verses of Scripture that we could do that with, and we could say it means thus and so. So to put this back into context, I want to go back and read our verse from last Sunday, and that would be verse 28. And verse 28 simply said this, and we know that all things work together for good. But then he told us whom that was applicable for, didn't he? He said, to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, who are those people? It's the saved, okay? So when he speaks in verse 28, and as he'll speak today in verse 29 and 30, he is speaking of and to the saved people, okay? Speaking to Christians. Now, here's our text for today. For whom, and that whom, that's those who, who love God, and those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, those he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. You can be seated. The word security is a big word in our world today. There are all kinds of security. There's national security. There's something called cyber security, and I'm not really sure what cyber security is other than it kind of deals with the computer world and the internet world and whatever world is all out there. There's Home security, some of you have home security systems, and there's, there's, the, there's, a, there's several different, not branches of our government, but there are several groups in our government that, that security is a, is a part of their, their business. We have homeland security, we have the National Security Administration, and different things like this. So security is a big deal. But the security of all of these things is not nearly as important as the security that we will talk about this morning. And this morning, what I want us to look at, because it's a part of the Word of God, and, 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 and here's what I'm going to ask you to do this morning, is I'm going to ask you to put away what you've been told. I'm going to ask you to put away what you've always heard. And let's make our decision, not because this is what daddy or granddaddy or somebody else said, but let's make our decision because this is what the Word of God says. And I would rather base my decision. I love my dad, I love my grandparents, and I love all of those. But I'm going to tell you, I don't want to make a decision based solely on what they told me. Because I'll tell you, they could have been wrong. I want to make a decision based upon the authority of the Holy Word of God. So this morning, here's what I want us to do. I want us to sort of start with a clean slate, and let's ask the Spirit of God in His ministry to lead us and guide us and show us and to teach us about this security. Therefore, in, in, in case what we may be thinking could be wrong, and we want to know the truth, Thus saith the word of God. So we know that security is a big deal. There is no more important security than security of the soul. Eternal security. So that's what we want to we talk about 
this morning. Now, we know from the Word of God that salvation is a super important issue. We, we know it is because Jesus said this in Mark, the 8th chapter and the 36th verse. He said, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? What will it profit a man? I'm telling you, nothing in this world is more important than your soul and where you will spend eternity. You'll spend it somewhere. It, it, there's not a lot of choices. There's only two. One, we will either spend it in heaven with the Lord or we will spend it in hell in a place that was created for the devil and all of his little imps. We'll spend eternity in one of those two places. So here's the truth, and I, I neglected to put this on your outline this morning, so I usually have a, have, a, have a little truth up at the top of the page, but I forgot it. So if you want to write this one down, this is it. It simply says, true believers are eternally secure in Christ. True believers are eternally secure in in Christ. And I want you to know this morning, this is not just a feel-good statement for the church. I believe with all of my heart that it's, it's God's truth. It's the teachings and it's the proclamation of the Word of God, and I believe that it is powerfully supported in the two verses of Scripture that we will look at today. That the, that the fact that true believers are eternally secure in Christ are powerfully supported in these verses of Scripture. That there was one commentary that I was reading in a, a couple of weeks ago, and he was speaking about these, about these two verses of Scripture, and, and he referred to this and, and what's held in these two verses as, as salvation's golden chain. Now, what we're going to see this morning is this, is, is, is the writer is going to use five verbs. Now, Thankfully, if you grew up in about the same era of time as I did, Schoolhouse Rock, remember that? Schoolhouse Rock taught us what about verbs? What kind of a word is it? It's an action word. If you don't know about Schoolhouse Rock, go home and Google Schoolhouse Rock verb edition, and you can watch Schoolhouse Rock's deal about verbs. Now, you, you do the, don't do that on your phone during church. But, but do that when you get home. But, but what, what we're going to see here is this. He's going to use five verbs. And all five of these verbs are used in the aorist or past tense. That means that these are things that God has already done. Okay, these are things that God has, has already uh, taken care of and carried out in his saving purpose. Now, we may disagree on jots and tittles about, about some different things, and, and, and maybe so this morning, but here's what I want to, I, I'll, I will, I think I can make this guarantee to you, that when we come to the end of this passage today, we're going to agree that God and God alone is the author and the provider of salvation. God and God alone is the author and the provider of salvation. And I believe we will also agree on the fact that he always completes what he starts. Okay? So let's look at these five things this morning. Here's the first one. God knows you intimately. God knows you intimately. Now for us to believe that... We've got to go back and remember that we are taught some things about God that, that we needn't forget. We're, we're taught three omni things. We're taught, one, that he is omnipresent. What does that mean? That means he's everywhere. We're also taught that he's omnipotent. What does that mean? That means he has all power. There's nothing impossible with him. Okay? But we're also taught that he's omniscient. Now, omniscient means the following, that he's all-knowing, that he is all-wise, and he is all-seeing, okay? He is, he's all-knowing, he's all-wise, and he's all-seeing. Now, that's just what God is, okay? Do we, if, if, we don't, if we don't believe that, we're going to have a hard time with these two verses of Scripture. So are we in the same boat? 
All right. Here's, what, here's the way verse 29 begins. For whom he foreknew. For whom he foreknew. Now what does foreknew mean or foreknow mean? It means to know beforehand, to know in advance. So here's what this means. You ready? This is going to be deep this morning. Now if you just end on a shallow mode, you'll, you'll get left behind pretty fast. So, so get in here, school teacher used to put on your thinking cap, so maybe you don't have anything else on your head, you might as well put on a thinking cap with us. But let's, let's go with this thing. This, this to know beforehand, for whom he foreknew, it goes far beyond just the place where we would say that he is aware of something. This does not mean that God just knew that in, in July, on July the 23rd, 2017, he didn't just know, he was not just aware that you and I would exist. It goes so far beyond that. You see, we come to the place where we realize some things. We, we do that all through the course of life. When we were 10, we, we knew things that we didn't know when we were 5. And we were 15, we learned things in between those two and, and so on and so forth. But, but listen to me. There, there has never been a moment. There has never been a scintilla of time that God did not know you intimately. Now, we can't say that about anybody else. You couldn't say that about my mom and dad. Who, who my mom gave birth to me on February the 14th, 1963. Now she could stand here today if she were present and she could give testimony to the fact that, that I've known that boy. I've known him personally and I've known him in all of those ways, but it's only been since February the 14th, 1963 at 4.04 in the afternoon. So that means for a good portion of her life, somewhere about 27 or 28 years of her life, she did not know me. But I'm telling you this morning that there has never been a scintilla of a second of all of history, eternity past, eternity present, and eternity future. There has never been a second that God did not know me Intimately. You say, what's that? Why do you keep using that word intimately? Let me tell you where that word came from. It, it, it's a word that's used in, in the Bible, and, it, and we get our word or we get our teaching of an intimate relationship between a husband and a wife. Now, bear with me because we don't talk about this from a pulpit very often, but I'm, I'm going to have to do this this morning. There are a lot of different ladies that I know, okay? I, I can walk up and I can call their name. I might even know what their address is. I might know what they do for a living. I might know who their husband is. I may know their children. I may know a lot of things about them. But I'm telling you, there is only one person in this world that I know intimately. And she's not here today, but that would be my wife. And Lord Terrence is coming, and I believe it's the Lord's will. She will be the only person that I will ever in my life know intimately. That's the word or the teaching that the Bible uses when, when we begin to look at this thing, that he knows us that way. That I, I'm telling you, there is nothing about you nor I that God does not know. God doesn't need you to say something so that he knows what you're thinking. God doesn't need you to do something so that he can know what's going on in your heart and mind. I'm telling you this morning, he knows. You say, well, how did he know all of this stuff? Well, I don't know how he, I don't know. I don't understand all of that, but I'm going to tell you what the Bible teaches us. The Bible teaches us that before the foundation of the world... God knew us intimately. You see, Paul wrote about this. Paul wrote this in Ephesians 1.4. He said, just as he chose us in him. Now listen, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. 
You say, brother, I, I, I can't grasp this thing. I, I can't wrap my mind about it. Well, let me tell you why. Because I can't either. And here's the reason. Because I have a peanut brain. Now, if we were to put my brain in comparison with him, it would be like taking the greatest mountain range on the face of the earth, and I don't know what that mountain range would be, and it would be like taking my little pea-sized brain and putting that up against the greatest mountain range that there's ever been. And I'm telling you, there is no way that my little peanut brain could be able to fathom everything that he's doing. In fact, we're told in Isaiah, the 55th chapter and the 8th verse, we're given these words, where, 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 where the Bible says that my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, are the heavens higher than the earth? Certainly they are. And he said, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So this morning, if you're saying, well, well I, I, I don't understand how he could foreknow, how he could know beforehand, and how he could know me intimately. I, I'm telling you this morning, if you've got to figure it out, before you will trust him, you will die, and you'll spend eternity in a devil's hell. I'm telling you that by faith that we can believe because the Word of God teaches us that, that he, has, he, has for, he foreknew us, He knows us intimately. And I'm telling you this morning that that thought humbles me because he, he not only knows me when I'm dressed up, He knows me when I'm doing things and, and past, present, and future when I'm doing things, saying things, and thinking things that I oughtn't to think. And he knew all of those things because he knew me. He knows me intimately. And yet he, he decided beforehand that he was going to love me. And he decided that he was going to save me. And he decided that he was going to call me. All because he foreknew me. I'm telling you this morning, God knows you intimately. And we are eternally secure because he knows us intimately. Second thing is this. God changes you radically. God changes you radically. So that verse 29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of of his son. Now that predestined, it, it just means that something was decided on beforehand. Something was decided on or predetermined beforehand. Now in, in this context, okay, in this context, this is not talking about election to salvation. It's not that he predestined some to be saved and some to be lost. I don't believe because it would contradict the Word of God that God just elected, I'm going to save him and him and her and her, but the rest of you can die and go to hell. I don't believe that. And that's not even what he's talking about here because he's talking about those who have been saved. And this morning, if you've been born again, he has predestined you to be conformed to the image of his Son. That, 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 is, that, that is, he wants to bring us as believers, he wants to bring us into a moral conformity to the likeness of his Son, Jesus Christ. That's what God wants to do. That's God's desire for you. That's God's desire for me. Nowhere, nowhere in Scripture are, are, are we taught that people are, are, are condemned eternally. In, in fact, those who the Bible speaks of as being condemned, the Bible tells us why they're condemned. The Bible tells us in John 3.18. Now, we all know John 3.16, don't we? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But then listen to verse 17 out of John 3. 
It says, for God did not send his, his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, what? Might be saved. Well, here's verse 18. It says, he, and that he is talking about us. He who believes in him, guess what? Is not condemned. You didn't hear me. He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already. But he doesn't stop there. He gives us, because it's kind of like talking to your kids and you tell your kids something and they always follow that up with that one word question. Why? I, 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 figure that, I figure that Jesus just thinks when he makes this statement that, that he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is, is condemned already, he figured there's going to be followed by the question, why? So he gives this answer. It is because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It is not because that, that God just decided one day that he was going to predestine this person and this person and this person to go to hell. Anybody that goes to hell goes to hell for one reason. Do you see it? They spend eternity in hell because they have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So this morning, we see that it is God's purpose that, that he is going to conform us, conform us at, to, to the image of his son. Now, now this word image, it, it's, it, our modern day word is, is the word icon. And on your computer or on your iPhone, you can, you can open up your iPhone and you'll have several different things show up there. And those little things are called icons. One of them on mine has, has a big E. It's a big red E. And I probably punch that one as much as I punch any other icon on my phone. You know what it stands for? ESPN. Because I've got to see how Jordan Spieth's doing this morning. I've got to see how the Astros are coming along. I got to see what's going on during football season. We got to see what the Aggies and the Longhorns and the Cowboys and the we got to see what they're doing. Well, well, well that's what that's what we use, and, and we have icons. You, you go sit down at your computer, and there's these there's this page that that is all of these icons, and these icons. It's not the program but it's the express image of that program. And if you push on that icon, it's going to take you to to that program. Well, well, well that's, what, that's what he is doing with us. He is conforming us to the image of his son. Now, now, the, now the Greeks back in this day, the Greeks, what, what they would see this as is they would see it as when they would go to a creek or to a river and they would be kneeling down or bending down there to get them a drink of water, they would see the reflection of the image of the sun the S-U-N sign. And, and they would see it, and this is the word that they would use. So, so this morning, here's, here's the deal with us. It is the will of God, it is the plan of God to conform us to the image of His Son. Do, do you remember that the Bible has also taught us that Jesus is the image of of the Father. Jesus is the image of the Father. It is the Father's plan to make you and I as believers into the image of His Son, Jesus. That's why we go back to that verse 28. This is, this is the activity, this is the, this is the work that God is doing in our life as different things happen and, and this happens and this happens and this happens and we learn and we're taught and we're shaped and we're molded and we're made into these things. It's because, listen, it's not because he's mad at us. It's not because he's upset with us. 
If he were just mad at us and upset with us, we need to understand that he could just take his finger and point at us and zap us out of here. He's in the business of conforming us to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. So let me ask you this. As a Christian, as a Christian, when God looks at you, there, we all know there's no hiding from God. So when, as a Christian, when, when God looks at you, and he looks at your life. Does he see you becoming more and more and more and more like the precious Son of God every day? I'm telling you. It's not, it's not the word of Steve. It's the word of God. That God the Father is conforming you and me to the image of his Son, Jesus Christ. And, 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 and listen, this is, he even goes on, I've, I've got I've to move on. Look at the latter part of that verse 29. The first part of it, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Then it, then it says this, so that he, and that's Jesus, so that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, let, let, let me just give you this, because we could, we, could we could stay on this all day. But here's what the Bible says in Colossians 1.15. I, I already mentioned this. It says, he, that's Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. But then it says this, the firstborn... The firstborn over all creation. Now, what do you think that word all means? It means all. That's exactly what it means. Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. Now, in, this, in that same chapter, you drop down to the 18th verse, and it says this, talking about Jesus. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead. Now listen to this, that in all things he may have preeminence. Can I tell you what that means for us today? That means this, Steve Cowart is not the head of Trinity Baptist Church. Nobody that you ever have and nobody that you ever will hire will be the head of the Trinity Baptist Church. I'm telling you, whether it's Trinity Baptist Church, First Baptist Church, Second Baptist Church, or whatever Baptist Church, or whatever other kind of church it is that's a, that's a, that's a Bible-believing church, he is preeminent. This is all about him. Most of you know that, that we're kind of, we've kicked off to being in the process of, of, of possibly hiring a, a children's minister. Now, there's a lot of us that have ideas about that. And there's a lot of us that think we know the ideal person. I, I want you to understand, and, and I have to understand this. It's not about what Steve wants, nor is it about what you want. Because I'm not preeminent. You're not preeminent. He's preeminent. We're to seek the will and the plan and the direction of God in this thing. Uh, so, so be it whatever happens to what we have. So, so this... <clears throat> This idea of being the firstborn, it, it speaks of his priority in time, and it speaks of his primacy or his priority in rank. So, so let's, let's go to number three. True believers, we're secure in Christ because he knows us intimately, because he changes us radically, and the third one is because God calls us decisively. God calls us decisively. Now, here's the beginning of verse 30. Moreover, whom he predestined... These he also called. Now this again is a past tense verb. He called. Now with, with, with Peter and also with, with, with Paul, the calling is more than an, just an invitation. It's more than a polite gesture. It is a gracious invitation to believe in Jesus Christ. 
It is a gracious invitation to believe in Jesus Christ. Now, now, now think with me here. Up to this point, the first two things that we've talked about here in this verse, in, in, in that previous verse, up till now, it has been concerned with God's mind and God's purpose. Whom he foreknew, he predestined. Now, all of a sudden, we become involved in this picture. We become involved in this picture. Those whom God has foreknown and predestined, he calls. Now, let me just give you this. Now, you, you know that I believe this, and I trust that you do. There is no way under heaven that we can be saved apart from the calling of God. Now, God calls us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convicts our heart of sin if, when, when we're lost. He convicts our heart of sin. He begins to open our minds and he begins to open our heart. And there's a, there, there's a point of, of, of interest there. And, and the Holy Spirit just begins to work. Listen, I grew up in a, and many of you did too, I know this. I grew up in a home where pretty well every Sunday of my life we were in church. Most Sunday nights we was in church. Most Wednesday nights, we was in church. I grew up where there was a Christian mom and a Christian dad had Christian grandparents as far as, as, far as I'm able to know the, one, the ones that I knew. But, but I, I want you to understand this. It doesn't matter what background you come from. I grew up in a Christian background. I grew up in a Christian home. But you know how I was able to get saved? The Holy Spirit of God had to speak to my heart and convict me of my sin, and I had to say yes to Jesus Christ. You say, man, that sounds simple. You grew up in a Christian home. I, I'm, I, I'm telling you this morning. I'm telling you he is all-powerful. That, that simply means this. You could have grown up in the ungodliest home that the world has ever known. You could have grown up with Madeline Murray O'Hara as your, as your housekeeper and your and your mama figure in your life, and I'm telling you this morning that he has the power to have called into that situation and saved you. I'm telling you this morning that, that, that you, you could be living in the context of immorality right now, and because he is omnipotent, that means he is all-powerful. He has the power to call into that ungodly, immoral situation and save you. He has that power. He has that authority. And, and I'm telling you, he does that through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, now, now let, let, let me read you this. I read you this a few weeks ago, but John 16, verse 7 and 8. Jesus is, is speaking to the disciples, and he says this specifically, to, or Peter's one that responds. But anyway, here's what it says. He says, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Now, can you imagine what's going through old Peter's mind when Jesus says this? Have you ever done this? Because something didn't make sense? Can't you just see old Peter standing there going, huh? What? How, what, do you, what do you mean, Lord, that, that it's to our advantage that you're going to go away? And then Jesus said this. He said, for if I do not go away, the Helper. Who is the helper? Holy Spirit. The, ho the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him, the Holy Spirit, to you. And when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he, the Holy Spirit, will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The Bible says in John 6, 44, it says this. No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. How does the Father draw us today? Through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's the way that he does that. In Acts 16, 14, the Bible speaks of a, of a, of a certain young woman, or a certain woman named Lydia. She was a... She Seller of purple in the city of, of Thyatira, and she worshiped God. But here's what the end of that verse says. The Lord 
opened her heart. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things that were spoken by Paul. How do you think the Lord opened her heart? I think it was through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I'm I'm telling you this morning that that if you're here and, and you've never been saved, that he has the power, he has the authority to reach down into your broken, soiled, sordid lifestyle and put a call to you to come to him to salvation. And let me say this, if he does that, Please respond to him. Because the Bible says that he will not strive with us always. So if we're at that blessed place in our life that we know that we're not living for the Lord, and some of us, we may know that we've never even been saved but we sense that the Holy Spirit of God is calling us and drawing us and wooing us. Please respond to that today. So he knows us intimately. He changes us radically. He calls us decisively. Decisively. The fourth one is this. He justifies us graciously. He justifies us graciously. Here's the end end of that verse 20, or the next part of verse 29. Whom he called, these he also justified. Justified. Now I heard somebody say one time that talking about the word justified or justification, that it is that that it's as though God makes it just as if I never sinned makes it just as though I, I, I've never sinned. Well, the, the, the New Testament word is, the, the old Greek word is some word along the lines of dikaiou. D-I-K-A-I-O-O. Now, now, what that word simply means is to recognize, to declare righteous, to justify as a judicial act. Now, judicial always has to do something with the meaning of of, of court, something along that line, of of a judgment, okay? So, So it's going by that definition, it is to justify as a judicial act. Now, here's what's happened. We all know, okay, and we can't argue with the fact that the Bible says there is none righteous. No, not one of us. Okay? But yet we've been declared righteous. Well, we also know this about Jesus, that the Bible says that he who knew no sin, he became sin. Well, he knows no sin, so if he becomes sin or takes on sin, whose sin does he take on? Ours. Yours and mine. Now, the Bible declares that there is none righteous. No, not one. So if we've been declared righteous and we know that we're not, then we have to take on someone else's righteousness, don't we? Whose righteousness do we take on? It's the righteousness of Christ. Bless God, it ought to make... And I'm I'm sure you're cold out there this morning, but it it ought to make a shivering Baptist... Say hallelujah to the fact that we have traded our sinfulness for his righteousness. I'm telling you this morning that he, he justifies us. Well, how does he do that? He does that through faith. How are we saved? By grace through faith. Well, listen to what the Bible says about our justification. Here's Romans 3.28. We were here several weeks ago. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. In Romans 5.1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ 
and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. No flesh will be justified. Galatians 3.24 says, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Romans 3, 23 and 24. The Bible says this, For all have sinned and, and come short or fall short of the glory of God. But listen to the 24th verse. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. I'm telling you this morning, God is a God of grace. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of love. And grace is God's love directed toward the guilty. And the guilty, that's me and you. That's you and I this morning. People, people who could not help themselves, regardless of how good good we were as far as we see goodness. Of all the good works that we could have laid claim to, we're, we're only justified by faith in the Son of God. He is our only hope. Our only hope. We've been justified by faith. See this morning when, when, when God looks at Steve Cowart, he doesn't see all the stuff of Steve Cowart's life. And, and I'm going to tell you, there's, there, there's, there, there's things that ought not be. I think things I oughtn't think. Sometimes I say things I oughtn't say. And I, I know you find that hard to believe, and I know that you don't have that problem. But I'm telling you, he doesn't see those things. He sees the righteousness of His Son, Jesus Christ, if I know Him. And by faith this morning, I know Him. And I know Him because He has called me. He called me, and you know the story, when I was 17 years old as a, as a high school student, He called me. And that's the reason that I'm saved today. Is because he called and I responded. So he knows me intimately. He, char he changes me radically. He calls us decisively. He justifies us graciously. And here's the last one. He glorifies us eternally. He glorifies us eternally. Here's the end of verse 29. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Now, we have to go back to these things that we know about God. And one of those things is He is all-knowing. Okay? He just, nothing ever dawned on Him, nothing ever occurred to Him. He's just all-knowing. He knows absolutely everything. So, future events are determined not just by whatever happens and brings things about, but future events, as, as we look at future events, future events are determined by God's prior decree. Okay? Future events are determined by God's prior decree. Now, this is why Paul, because all, these five verbs that we talked about this morning, these five action words that God has, has done, that's why that that Paul can speak of glorification in the past tense. Now, w w when are we going to be glorified? It hadn't happened yet. It hadn't happened yet. It's going to one day. It's going to because the Word of God says it's going to happen. So here, here, here's what I believe that we, can, that we can say about this. If God has decreed something, it is just as good as if it had happened yesterday. Let me, get, let me give you a case in point. In Luke, I believe it's the 8th chapter, and it begins with the 22nd verse, and it, and it goes on for about three or four verses. But, 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 but over there, and let, let, let me just flip it. There, there it is. Oh, in, in, the midst of this, in the midst of this passage, let me find where, there, there I am. In the 22nd verse, 
Okay, if, if you flipped over there, you can already tell that the, the, the line above it says, the wind and wave obey Jesus. Now here's what had happened, okay? The disciples were about to get in the boat and, 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 and go across, and, 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 and as they did, he got into the boat with his disciples, and here's what he said to them. He said, let us cross over to what? To the other side. Let us cross over to the other side of the lake. Now, we know that they're not there yet because the very next word says, and they launched out. That means somebody, if, if they do it like we do in a flat-bottom boat, that means that, that somebody got out on the bank and they pushed the flat-bottom boat out to a foot or two of water and then they jumped over the end of the boat. I've always been so fat and slow, I couldn't jump over the end of the boat. I got to get in the first place. But if you're skinny and in shape and can run, you probably was the boat pusher. Well, well, that's what they did, and Jesus has already made the statement, let us cross over to the other side. Well, they get out there in the middle of that thing, and Jesus goes down, and he goes to sleep. Well, what happened when Jesus went to sleep? Storm came. Man, a storm came down those mountain passes, and it engulfed the entire sea. And I mean, the winds were blowing, the waves were blowing, pounding and they were rocking and probably the lightning was flashing and all of those disciples on that boat they said oh what are we going to do so they go down in the boat and they and they wake Jesus up and they said Jesus there's a storm he said we're taking on water we're probably going to drown you remember what Jesus did now, now listen this is this is a paraphrase on my part I just picture Jesus, he, he's laying there, and he, and he probably got up, and he propped himself up on his elbow, and he looked out there to the sea and the wind and the waves and all of those things, and he said, hush! Hush! And you know what happened? The sea was as calm as it had ever been, ever before. I tell you that story to make this point. He has promised, He has promised all of these things. I'm telling you that He glorifies us eternally. The day's going to come. I don't know when. It, it, it could be next week, next month. I, I, I don't know when. I just know that according to the Word of God, that one day I'm going to be glorified. That means that I'm going to have a body that I don't have to eat low carbs. That means if he puts chocolate pie out there at the marriage supper of the lamb by doggies, I'm going to dig into that chocolate pie. And if he lays fried chicken out there, hutch, I'm going to eat some. Not going to gain a pound. Not going to have to get on the scale in the morning when I get up. Not going to have to buy new clothes down there at Belks and look for the sale. Not going to have to do any of those things because one day, bless God, I'm going to be glorified. Hadn't happened yet. But I'm going to tell you this. Because he said it, it's as good as done. You say, how certain are you of that, Brother Steve? I'm, this is how certain I am. That it can be spoken of. It's a, it's a future tense event that's going to happen yet. But it is so certain that the Holy Spirit of God, who inspired the writing of the Word of God, could speak of it in the past tense. So don't you worry your little mind, not one iota, of whether these things are ever going to happen. or not. I'm telling you that if God said it, it's done. I'm telling you this morning. I think one of the reasons that the church is no more effective than it is in our culture is because we have so many people running around that are members of the church that they really don't even know that they're eternally saved. I'm telling you this morning, not because I said it, not because I think it, not because I believe it, but because the Word of God teaches it. Believers are eternally secure in Christ. That makes this the pertinent question. Do you know for certain 
that you're saved. Do you know for certain that you're saved? Do you know that you'll go to heaven when you die? I'm telling you, I hear people all the time, and they say, I hope. I'm telling you this morning, there is no way that I would walk out that door hoping that I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to go out that door here in just a little while, knowing as far as I'm able to know but by my faith in his word that he's going to keep me. He's going to keep me. He saved me. He had that planned out before the foundations of the world were. I didn't get the call until October of 1980. But he called me in October of 1980, and he saved me, and he, is, he has justified me, and, and my glorification's just as good as done. He said, Brother Steve, I, I just don't know. Well, imagine this. Let's put this in a number that we can process. Let's just, let's just imagine that, that God takes ten people, and he knows them intimately. And those ten people that he knows intimately, he changes them radically. And those same ten people that he changes radically, he calls them to salvation decisively. He calls them. And then those same ten he justifies graciously. And those same ten he, he, he will glorify eternally. How many of that ten that he started with will he end up with? Just in case you don't know, it'll be all ten of them. And I'm telling you this morning, our God will not lose anybody who has been truly saved by faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. He will not lose you. You are eternally secure in Christ. Bless God. Oh, what a wonderful, glorious Savior that we have. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your truth. Thank you that you could see fit to, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to have these words written in your word for us in 2017 as we struggle through life and we struggle through things and we struggle through events and we struggle with certainty. But yet we can look into your word today and by faith we can believe and we can know that you are well able not only to save us, but you're well able to keep us. Thank you this morning that every one of us in this room who have been truly saved by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ that we are eternally secure. This morning, if there would be one man, woman, boy, or girl in this room that has never placed their faith and their trust in you, Lord, if today is the day that through the ministry of the Holy Spirit that you are calling them, that today would be the day that they would respond that they would answer the call and they too would place their faith and their trust in you. And you begin the process that you have already set in place to conform them along with the rest of us as believers to be conformed to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you for saving an old wretch such as I. And thank you for the security that comes with that salvation. Save the one in this service who may not know you. I pray it in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Lass Sterne stehen.